privilege to be able to share with you again and once more we're looking at our series of called and equipped and over the last few messages in the series we have been looking at some of the common things that we have been called to be and called to do as part of that call of Jesus to follow him we've looked at our call to be a blessing we've looked at our call to serve one another humbly in love and last time we looked at our call to peace and all that flows from his call to us, uh, to himself, knowing that we are called and knowing that we are loved. And it all comes from his choice of us, that we are his masterpiece. You are his masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. And this week we conclude a little bit of a section in our series that looks at some of these common things that God has called us to be and do. Now, while I appreciate there are many things that we are called to be and do, uh, these are only a few things in this series that I've highlighted based on what I felt the Lord was laying on my heart. And I would really encourage you in your own time to study the Word of God and to look at some of the other things that God calls us to be and do. So to wrap up this little section in our series, we're going to look at our call to go, our calling to go. Now, we all know that here in the UK, we have this very clear message that during the coronavirus, we have to stay at home. And it's absolutely vital that we continue to follow the government guidelines. So how does a message of call to go correlate with the position that many of us find ourselves in today. Well, let's just remind ourselves of what Jesus said about our call to go. And if you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to Matthew chapter 28, and we'll be reading some very familiar passages uh, there. Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. It says this, then the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Amen. And may God add a blessing to the reading of his word. Now, before we get into unpacking this call to go, there's something that I just felt the Holy Spirit draw to my attention that takes place before Jesus gives his disciples what has become known as the Great Commission. We often focus from verse 18, the start of the Great Commission where Jesus commands us to go. Um, but we often forget who the Great Commission was given to. It was not just given to disciples. It was given to disciples who are worshipping Jesus. Yes, some of them had doubts, but all of them were worshipping Jesus. And I just felt the Holy Spirit highlight the importance of this. We have to be worshippers of Jesus. It's okay to have some doubts, have some questions, but there still needs to be that choice to worship Jesus. What was it that Jesus said in, in John chapter 4, that a time is coming and has now come when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshippers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshippers must worship in spirit and in truth. There is a command to worship. We must worship him in spirit and in truth. You see, when we are worshippers, first and foremost, then it's, it's not about us. It's not even about those people that we are called to go to, but it's all about Jesus. And I'm not talking about worship, just meaning singing some songs or raising our hands in the air or speaking in tongues, all of which are good and important things to do. I'm talking about the kind of worship that we read about in Revelation chapter 4, 
where the, like the 24 elders, we fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and forever, where we lay down our crowns before the throne or worship like we read about in Revelation chapter 5, which says the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, where the elders fell down and worshipped. Are we worshippers? Do we fall down before him and cry, Holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. Worthy is the Lamb. Are we abandoned before him? Are we surrendered to his majesty? Because unless we are worshippers, unless we are true worshippers, not just worshippers that go through the motions, but true worshippers, then everything that we talk about in this series about calling will just go in one ear and out the other. And if we need help in this area, well, as Chris shared with us last week, we have a helper. We can ask the Holy Spirit to help us get that fresh vision of Jesus that causes us to do as the Apostle John did in Revelation 1, that when I saw him, that is Jesus. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But listen, look what Jesus does for the Apostle John in that place of absolute worship before him, in that place of absolute surrender before him. Jesus says, then he, pla- the, says, then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last I am the living one. I was dead, but now look, look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death in Hades. Hallelujah. That's the Jesus that we serve. That's the Jesus that we worship. And in that place of worship on the mountain, where the disciples were, with all their doubts and their questions, um, About all that, Jesus comes and says to his worshipping disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to Jesus. Now that just makes me want to worship him more. But that authority was given to Jesus for a reason. It says, therefore, what has the authority been given to Jesus therefore? Well, it's to send us out. It's to send us out, his worshipping disciples, to go. And to go knowing that Jesus, who has all the authority on heaven and on earth, is with us. Always. Always. And when Jesus says always, he means always. He doesn't mean most of the time, but he means all of the time. Always with us. To the very end of the age. We don't go in the authority given to us from Jesus. We go in the knowledge that he who is always with us to the very end of the age has all authority in heaven and on earth. In the knowledge that Jesus who is with us and that he has all authority in heaven and on earth, in that knowledge, therefore, We go as worshipping disciples to make disciples. You see, if we're not worshipping disciples, then we're just going as disciples. But God, but what God desires is not disciples of a church denomination. He doesn't want disciples of of a style of worship. And God help us, he certainly doesn't want disciples who behave exactly the same as we do sometimes. That's not what we are to make. We are to make disciples who are worshipping disciples. Disciples who fall down before Jesus and say, Holy are you, Lord. Worthy are you, Lord. Let me follow you wholeheartedly because only you, Lord. Only you, Lord. It's all about you, Jesus. Disciples who are true worshippers. Who worship him in spirit and in truth. 
So if we are to make disciples of Jesus who are worshipping disciples of Jesus, then that means that we have to be one ourselves. So what does it mean to be a worshipping disciple? Well, exactly the same as what Jesus asks us to go and make. Being a worshipping disciple contains two things. It involves being baptised in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And secondly, it involves being taught to obey everything that Jesus has commanded us. Our journey starts by coming to faith in Jesus. We heard and we received the good news that God loves us, that he sent his son into the world to pay the price for our sin that separated us from God. And when we repented, which means that we acknowledge our wrong before God and we turn away from that wrongdoing and turn to God, by believing in Jesus, by believing in what Jesus has done for us on the cross, believing that he took the punishment for our sin, believing that he rose from the dead, knowing that there is life beyond the grave. When we believe that and receive him into our hearts, then the scripture says that God promises that we will have everlasting life. We will know an eternity with him and we call that heaven. We know without a shadow of a doubt that we will go straight to heaven when we die. God saves us from an eternity separated from him, which we commonly know as hell. And if you are watching this this morning and you do not know without a shadow of a doubt that when you die, you will go straight to heaven, then I have got good news for you this morning. News that God loves you, that he sent his son into the world to die for you, to pay the price for all your wrongdoing. So that if you repent, if you acknowledge your sin before God and say, God, I've done wrong. I'm sorry for what I've done wrong. I turn away from that way and I turn to you by believing in you, believing that what you have done for me on the cross believing that you rose to give me life, an abundance of life. If you believe that and receive Christ into your heart, then the Bible says that you can know eternal life. And Christ comes in and he transforms our lives and gives us a hope and gives us a future. That's the good news. And then you will know without a shadow of a doubt that when you die, you'll go straight to heaven because Christ is in you, the hope of glory. That's good news. That is the best news. That's why Jesus says the first step to being a disciple is to be baptised in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says this because baptism, and I mean baptism, believers' baptism by fully immersing someone into water, symbolises People starting that new life with that recreated identity and purpose, which is what has happened on the inside when we believe and receive Christ into our lives. We get baptised into the name of the Father. With God as our Father, we are now part of his family, which is the church. We, come be, we are immersed into God's family. We become part of it. We get baptised, immersed into the name of the Son. With Jesus, Jesus as our King, we now live as one who serves him and serves others for their entire life. Just the way Jesus did. Because we are to follow him. And we get baptised into the name of the Holy Spirit. That same Spirit that sent Jesus on his mission, empowering everything that he did. And that spirit now lives in us and, allow, and sends us out on that very same mission. To be immersed and filled with the spirit, to be being filled with the spirit, so that out of our inner being flow rivers of living water, bringing the life of the spirit, that spirit-filled life, to those around us. This is what it means to become a disciple of Jesus. We are born again. We are born of God. We are born of the Spirit. But it doesn't end there. 
because Jesus says the next thing that we are to be taught to obey everything Jesus has commanded us. This isn't something that we learn in a six week course, you know, take a quiz at the end of your knowledge and boom, you've got a certificate that says you're a disciple of Jesus. That's not how it works. We don't get a diploma in this. We don't get some sort of degree in it. It's something you become, something that God makes you if you allow him as you follow him. And because, and that comes not just by learning and by hearing, but it comes by putting that learning into practice, to obey, to follow Jesus. The writer to the Hebrews says that maturity in Christ, that maturity in Christ uh, come about that takes that teaching about righteousness and it says by constant use, by constant use, have trained themselves to distinguish from good and evil. The Apostle Paul had a, a passion for this. He tells the Philippians, not that I have already obtained all this or have arrived at my goal, but I press on for that which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what is ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And it's a lifetime passion. It's not plain, plain sailing. It takes perseverance. It takes endurance through many trials, lots of suffering. There's battles, there's blessings, but the prize is worth it. Look at what Paul says now the end of his, near the end of his life to Timothy. He says, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. This is what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. Okay, so we know what it means to become a disciple, what it means to be a disciple and a worshipping one at that. But how does that worshipping disciple make disciples? Well, as I was thinking about this, Acts 11 came into my mind. Again, I believe a prompt from the Holy Spirit. A passage concerning the church of Antioch that displayed the DNA of church, what it is to be church. Is something that we looked at a couple of weeks ago and if you want to listen to that whole sermon then you can just go to our YouTube channel go to the playlist of preaching through our vision and it's the last sermon in that series but the summary of it is this the church in Antioch did four things they reached they got involved they equipped and they released reach involve equip release this is the DNA of church. Not a building, not a church service, online or otherwise, but this is the DNA that has been placed inside every single worshipping disciple of Jesus. Many people think that the Great Commission is about evangelism, but it's not. Yes, evangelism is certainly an important part of it, but it's more than that. If we make it only about mission, about evangelism, then we actually miss the mission of the Great Commission, which is to go and make disciples of all nations. And if we are worshipping disciples ourselves, we know that when we truly worship him, we express our love for him. And if we love him, we'll obey his commandments. Again, as Chris shared with us last week, if we need help obeying his commands, then we have a helper. We can ask the Holy Spirit to help us, to allow the Holy Spirit to enable us. Because let's face it, we all need help and we need his help to reach, to get involved, to equip and to release. To reach, to reach others with the good news of Jesus that they may believe and they may be baptised. To be involved, to encourage, to build up, to serve, to love, 
to bless, to bring peace, to be involved in the lives of our fellow believers so that people will know that we are his disciples. To equip, to train, to be taught, to be instructed, corrected, rebuked, disciplined where necessary through the word of God so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. To release, to give to those around us what God has given to us by his grace. To operate in our God-given gifting and calling. To allow God to work in you and through you. To be his masterpiece. Created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God has prepared in advance for us to do. And it's all to his glory. And the more I think about what it means to be a worshipping disciple, to make worshipping disciples, the more I am convinced that it's not a one-to-one -one relationship, but it's a many-to-many -many relationship. Jesus did not say to each disciple, go and make another disciple, who will then make another disciple. He said, he told all the disciples together to go and make disciples together. You see, we all have a responsibility to reach, to tell them the good news. One disciple might sow the seed, another disciple might water it, another disciple might water it some, some more until that seed dies to self and brings forth life. You see, it's a team effort. It's a body effort. It's in our DNA. It's being the church. We all have a responsibility to be involved in encouraging one another, loving and serving one another humbly in love. We all have a responsibility to correct one another in love, to bear with one another. One may encourage, another may bless, another may give a scripture, another might pray with them. It's about being involved and helping one another be disciples of Jesus. It's a team effort. It's in our DNA. It's called being the church. We all have a responsibility to be equipped, to grow in our understanding of the word of God so that faith grows and faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. One can teach, another can help understand, another might be able to help and correct and love. Again, it's in our DNA. It's a team effort. It's being the church. And we all have a responsibility to release and be released to operate in our God-given gifting and calling. Because when we operate in that, we are a reflection of Jesus to those that we are ministering to. We are being who God has called us to be and every single part of the body is needed. And we'll be spending some more time on that in the coming weeks. So in conclusion, I was watching something that was posted on Facebook earlier in March by launch Church Multiplication Catalyst and it showed a video clip from back in November 2019 from Danielle Strickland who was speaking at one of the events that they had and she said this chaos is not your enemy it's your friend it's the starting place of all things in Genesis 1 2 it says now the earth was formless and empty darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And Daniel Strickland went on to say that the Holy Spirit hovers above the chaos of the formless and empty earth in the Genesis account. But she also said the Holy Spirit hovers over every beginning account. The Holy Spirit hovers, just waiting, hovering right in that place of surrender. You see, the earth in the beginning of the Genesis account was in the place of surrender. The Holy Spirit was hovering and God spoke. And Daniel Strickland went on to say that he is looking to speak life and newness and new creations and new things and new movements and new strategies and new ways of evangelism and new ways of kingdom into being right here and there was something prophetic in what she was saying five months ago back then because who would have thought that less than five months after she said that we as a human race human race could be as you may describe in a time of chaos in unprecedented times 
And when I watched that video, something in my spirit leapt because I sensed that God was about to do something. Two weeks ago, Karen and I took part in an online prayer meeting with other uh, senior leaders in the Apostolic Church in Scotland. And Stephen Anderson shared a dream that he had, and I have his permission to share it. In the dream, he saw the word rest spelled out, R-E-S-T. And then he saw an E drop between the S and the T to make the word reset, R-E-S-E-T. And he felt the Lord was saying that this is a word, an opportunity for the church in this time. Many think that this pandemic and the message to stay at home um, means it's a time of rest. It's not a time of rest. It's a time of reset. Time to get back to being the DNA of church. To be worshipping disciples who make disciples by reaching others, by being involved, by being equipped and by being released. And I sense an affirmation in my spirit on that. And the Holy Spirit is hovering over this chaos. And are we ready? Are we in that surrender position? Are we ready to be reset? To be the church as Jesus intended us to be? Who can we reach? Who can we pick up the phone to? Who can we contact, make a connection with, to tell them and express to them the love of Jesus? Who can we be involved in to help encourage and build up and strengthen to help them be that disciple of Jesus, to help them on their journey? How can we be equipped? Who are we listening to? Where can we learn the truths of God's word to allow us to be ready for every service that he calls us to? And how can we be released? How can we give out of what God has given to us to those around us so that they see Jesus? So that they see his love. The disciples went to Galilee. To a mountain where Jesus told them to go. They went to be reset. There they worshipped him. Though some had doubts and concerns about what lay ahead. But they were in the surrender position. And in that place of worship of Jesus... Jesus comes to them and says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. When this is over, Will we go back to how things used to be? Or will the church emerge doing something new? Or rather something that we see more aligned to the book of Acts. Reaching, involving, equipping, releasing. Will the church be worshipping disciples who make disciples? Let's bow our heads just going to ask the Holy Spirit to come and minister to where you are just now. We just say, Holy Spirit, come. Come to every single person under the sound of my voice. Come and minister in your presence. And Father, if there's any there that do not know you as their Lord and Saviour, Father, I pray now, right now, Lord, by your Spirit, you would allow them to turn to you, to repent and put their trust in you for the forgiveness of their sins. And Lord, that they would come to know you and receive you as their Lord and Saviour. Father, for those of us that have maybe been on the road of being a disciple for some time, but Father, for those that maybe don't feel they've been a worshipping disciple, or for those of us maybe that struggle to obey all the commands of Jesus, or struggle to reach or be involved or equip or release. Father, I pray your Holy Spirit now would come and minister into their lives. Bring your challenge, bring your truth. And Lord, help us by your Spirit 
to be changed, to be transformed, because only you, Lord, are the one that can transform us, that can change us into be more of who you want us to be. So, Lord, help us, we pray, be the bride of Christ that you intend us to be. Lord, that we may shine with your love and for your glory. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.